Well, as we mentioned, we're coming to the end of uh, our study in 2 Timothy, and I want to invite you to open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you would, right at the end of this little letter. That is Paul's final letter. Um, I don't know what your habits are uh, in terms of Bible study, but I hope um, that you're, you're struggling well uh, to find a place to give God uh, an opportunity to speak into your life, to remind you of who you are, of who he is, and what really matters. Um, um, and, and you're finding that time, whether you're on vacation or not on vacation, whether you're in a normal cycle of work or things are interrupted because of the summer, uh, whether your kids are at school or not at school, uh, all those different challenges that you find to try to maintain a pattern. Um, but one of the evidences, right, of the things that are most valuable to us is that we make time for them. And I want to encourage you to, to continue to struggle to do that. This is not to make you feel bad for having a bad week and saying, well, I can't remember. What, I know I picked up my Bible last Sunday. This is not the intent of that. It's just to keep, keep working at making a, 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 a time for God to speak into your life, to hear that. Uh, and I was just noting as I come to the end of a, of a study in a given book, or if I've been reading somewhere, I would think something that's characteristic about my Bible is it's usually all marked up. Now, I know some of you like to keep your Bible pristine uh, in terms of that. I don't keep mine pristine. I keep it worn. Uh, and so usually the pages are dirty. Uh, it's not, not, not a good thing. Maybe it's got coffee spills on them, which has happened in my other Bible at home, it's got a coffee spill on it. I don't do that to try to make it look authentic. It just happened, right? Uh, all those kind of things happen just because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it all the time and I'm making notes to myself and I see little things that, that stick out to me and then later on, sometimes I'm attracted to go back to them and when I look back through 2 Timothy, I got little notes written in the margin on the side. Uh, some of them I can read, some of them because I wrote them I can't read, you know, those kind of things. But they're all, they're all written in there and so I hope you're doing that and I want to encourage you uh, to make space to make those happen. There are moments in life when life narrows. What I mean is that there are moments when the situation around you at home or at work or in your community makes it hard for you to live your life as you would want to and may even force you to give up things that you enjoy. For example, if you lose your job and your career doesn't go the way you thought, your financial options get limited. Uh, if you're in a relationship with someone and all of a sudden the relationship goes south or something goes wrong with the other person or something happens and all of a sudden what you had hoped was going to be your future is no longer your future and life, the options seem to narrow. Uh, and often that's really difficult in terms of relationships because if the relationship has gone any length of time, uh, the person who's most vested in the relationship has begun to envision some sort of future of them together. Sometimes these narrowing moments come about because of a change in your health, whether that comes about through sickness or aging. All of a sudden you cannot do what you had looked forward to. Something is wrong with your body so that you can't have a child or you can't fly planes. I say that one because I had a, a guy at Cedarville that I knew that his lifelong dream was to be a fighter pilot. He wanted to be that. He had organized his life to be that. He wanted to be that. And then he came to take the fighter pilot uh, 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 exam, which is a thoroughgoing everything exam, and they found a genetic defect in his optic nerve that was going to prohibit him from uh, flying fighter planes because of the G-forces and what would happen. And so at one moment, just out of some little thing that he had never known that never affected his eyesight, boom, his life dream that he had had changed. Uh, you can't run. You used to run and you'd love to run and now that crazy knee won't let you run anymore. You're just glad to get up out of bed, right? You can't eat what you enjoy, right? You found out that you're something intolerant, right? You can't eat something that you wish you could eat. And the crazy thing is, is when you can't eat something you wish you could eat, that's all you want to eat, right? Uh, so you can't do that. Or you find out you cannot do what you used to do or live where you want to live. It's too painful to get around. It's too strenuous. It's too risky. Or there are too many steps. You can't get up them. Your time gets taken up with doctor appointments, hospital visits, and drug consultations. 
You must read up on and understand things related to your condition that you would rather not know anything about at all, right? You become a, 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 a patron of WebMD, right? Or something like that because you're constantly there. Uh, I know as I talk to my mom, I love her. Often uh, when I call her and I'm going down to visit her, uh, my visits revolve around her doctor appointments, right? Uh, to make sure that I'm going to be able to see her and she's not going to be somewhere down in Portsmouth or Chill Coffee or someplace along those lines. So in those moments when life narrows, you'll learn a lot about yourself. This is true even if you're not the one directly experiencing the narrowing because it's something happening to your spouse or your relative or your child or your friend, right? Even if it's not you that are facing the physical difficulties, even if it's not you that is experiencing a reversal, if it's somebody close to you, well, then God in his providence is bringing that into your life too. So you get to participate in that. So you'll learn about that person too as they respond to it. You'll find out where their sense of worth lies, right? One of the characteristic things is when a man finds out that all of a sudden the thing that he loves to do or that he's put his identity in no longer that he, can, he can't do it any longer, then all of a sudden life is not worth living. Some will respond to this new limitation with anger and despair, right? Here's all these things. My life is over. My life is just not worth living. What's the use why me? This is so unfair. How could this happen to me? Right? Those are all the things that happen when it seems like the walls are coming in. So today we come to the end of the last letter Paul will ever write. The walls are figuratively and literally closing in. There will be no more missionary journeys, times of proclaiming the gospel in the marketplace, in the synagogue, or in house church fellowship. They're over. Hopes that he had for further ministry will not be realized. As we read uh, the New Testament, we know Paul wanted to go on west to Spain. The early church record is, is, is uncertain, but it doesn't look like he ever made it to Spain. Uh, we know that Paul had longed before he got to Rome that he wanted to go to Rome, but he got to go to Rome twice, but both times as a prisoner. First time he got released, the second time he went to death row. Relationships that he cherishes and draws life from are coming to an end. And some of them are not where he would want them to be. This is one of the sad things about what we're going to read this morning. Uh, he has been deserted by some of the people closest to him. And beyond that, he can't do anything about that because he can't go after them. He can't pursue them. He can't get to them, uh, obviously, from prison. And though Paul has no illusions about escaping death, now he lives with the keen awareness that his days on earth are limited. He may even have a date for his execution. Right? All of us right, have a death sentence over us. If Christ doesn't return and take us up, right, as my dad often said, I'd prefer the upper taker rather than the undertaker. Right? If Christ doesn't come before right, we die, then all of us have an appointment with death. And, but it's different when you walk into a doctor's office and they say, I think you have six months. Or maybe we should call hospice. Right? Or you have a date set for your execution. And that just puts an edge on life in ways that we all try to a certain degree, live with death as something we don't want to think about. We want to put it out to the edge. Uh, usually speaking, the younger we are, the more it's not relevant to us. But we put it out there and, and keep it away from us. Now Paul can't afford to put away from him unless he wants to live in denial. So this book has revealed a lot about the man Paul is. As his life narrowed, as his options were limited, we've seen how Paul responded. Today, we take one last look about oh, what an unstoppable man with an unstoppable God does when the walls of life are closing in on him. The passage we are looking at today relays his personal notes that follow his final charge to Timothy. And let me, let me just make a, a comment about this. Um, right? Parents, we live in our homes with our kids. Our kids know us. Right? They know us. They know us beyond what we say we believe. They know us in terms of what we actually live. Right? And one of the ways that, that you can truly tell uh, what a person believes is what happens to them and how they respond to real adversity. <laughs> what, what, what do they do when things really get dark? You can tell what's in a person because whatever's there, whatever facade they've put up, 
whatever you know, Pollyannish words they've said, whatever cliches they've poured out, if, if they don't really believe those things, when life you know, gets to boiling point, it's going to melt away and, and what they truly trust in is going to show up. Right? They're going to run to some place to find deliverance. So he's wrapping up this letter uh, and he's giving Timothy, interestingly enough, all the kind of relational information that forms the backdrop of his and, and, and Paul's ministry. It's like, it's like a report from the home office, right, for a missionary. Paul is, is telling Timothy about his situation, and he's telling Timothy about all of his colleagues and where they are. Some of the information is good. Some of the information is really sad, right? And Paul is giving just a backdrop, and he's kind of taking Timothy out of his own place. And we've talked about where Timothy is. He's in a church that's in trouble. He's in a church where the leadership has left the truth. He's in a church where he actually has to go in and confront pastors of house churches and deal with them, and they have followers who are very happy with their false teaching. I mean, Timothy is in a very difficult situation himself. Well, now Paul's kind of pulling him out of that and connecting him with himself, with Paul, and connecting him with his colleagues where they are. So it's like a, a report from the home office that lets Timothy know about what's going on in Italy and Greece and Asia Minor. That's what he reports on, all the workers uh, in the kind of area where Paul has been ministering. So as we read these last remarks, I want to draw our attention to what it reveals about Paul's outlook on life. What do these last comments teach us about how to approach those moments when life narrows our options? How do we approach them without stepping back from our commitment to Christ and our commitment to his mission? What does it look like? And so we're going to deal with about four or five different things that you can see there. I hope you have your notes in the bulletin, and I'm going to fill in the blanks for those as we work our way through, uh, and you're prepared for what God wants to teach you. But I, I want to ask you, if you're in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, would you stand with me and let's read these last uh, verses here, beginning with verse 9 down to the end of this small little book, verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he has loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, as do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So I just want to, as I was reading through uh, this uh, list of Paul's interactions, um, it's just a display of Paul's character. It's a display of what's important to him. Uh, and, and in a moment where uh, everything has kind of been boiled down, when he's facing the end of life, what are the kind of things that Paul uh, does here and how does he face this moment? What does it look like? Now the first one, if you're, you want to fill in your notes, is a simple one here. Paul is honest. Paul is honest about his situation and his needs. Paul is honest about his situation and his needs. Paul's not in denial about the challenges that he faces, and nor is he forgetful of the resources that he has. Right? So he's not in denial, and he's not um, forgetful of the resources that he has. He has an honest 
uh, assessment of where he is. Now, I don't know about you. One of the things that I find about myself as I get here is often I'll find myself in particular because I'm a, I'm a kind of a, a muller, a stuffer. Um, uh, Ron is not a muller and a stuffer. Ron is, it's out there. Whatever's going on, I can, I can walk home at the end of the day. I can look across the kitchen and look at my wife's demeanor and know kind of a, a good idea of what kind of day it was, right? Uh, if Ronna doesn't like something, I know she doesn't like something, right? If she loves something, I know she loves it. And Ronna has a scale of appreciation, depreciation that's usually one to 10, right? Things are really great or they're horrible and I hate them, right? Uh, and so it comes with decorations in the house. It comes with food that we eat. It comes with, and one of her, one of her key things to let me know that she doesn't like something if she's trying to be uh, kind of measured and uh, we'll go out to eat and I'll say, well, how was your meal? It's all right. And I know that's a, a nice way of saying I hated it, right? Uh, in terms of her, it's all right, right? Which I know that, because if she likes it, she's going to go, oh, she's going to have told me before I even ask, right? So even asking the question is trying to get at the idea that I know uh, she didn't get something that she liked, right? But for me, when it comes to my inner state and things like that, I'll find myself getting down. And it's a great day, and I don't have any reason, apparently, for getting down. Or I'll find myself getting anxious about something. And I'm trying to figure out, well, why am I anxious about something? And I'll, try to, and I'll have to sit down and figure out what is going on inside. And sometimes, because of the way I'm wired, I don't like conflict. And I'm anticipating a conversation I have to have with someone about a conflict. And I'm already starting to feel anxious about it before it happens. Right? Or I'm depressed about something because I know I'm going to be doing something here in the next couple of days that's going to really take me out of my comfort zone. Right? Or I'm anticipating some difficulty. Well, Paul here uh, is honest about his own needs, about where he is. He has an honest assessment about what's going on in his soul. And, and sometimes for us, we need, when we come to times of stress, we need to be able to think carefully about what's going on. What are we afraid of losing? What are the things that are giving us tension? What is really at stake here in this moment? And sometimes we don't reflect on it and we just blurt out on each other. Right? We attack our spouse, we attack our friends, we withdraw, right? we do all these kind of things. We get super busy to try to manage it. And without trying to name the thing about what's going on, what is it that I'm really worried about? What is it that I'm really afraid of? Right? Those kinds of things. Well, Paul has an honest assessment. And I want, I want to point out some of these things here. So what's his situation as he tries to look at it? Right? Look at verse 16. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Right? Now, what Paul's referring to is that he had an he had a, he had a initial trial before Caesar. Right? The, the back story of this is if you read the book of Acts, he has the ability as a Roman citizen, he could appeal all the way to Caesar to have his case heard, the Supreme Court of the day. Right? A tremendous privilege. He did that for the sake of the gospel. And he had made his first defense now, and nobody stood up for him in court. Nobody came there to be identified with him. Now, this is in the ancient world to stand up and identify with someone who's going to be accused of treason against Rome is not socially a very wise thing to do if you want to keep your life, right? And so often they would just sweep in, right, the people who were there as, as uh, he's the ringleader and s sweep in their followers, right, in a dragnet around, right, the arrest of the ringleader, right? So what Paul's dealing with here is that people have, have stood back and they not, have not been willing to come and identify. Now, Paul is speaking in, in kind of a, a hyperbole here because he says right here that Luke is with him, right? He says also earlier on, if you remember back in chapter one, that uh, the household of Onesiphorus, Onesiphorus in his household, he came to Rome, he sought Paul out because they didn't have a public registry of prisoners, they didn't walk down and they had, you know, the office where you could go and find out where Paul was imprisoned. No, there was no concern about his rights or about anything along those lines. So Paul's in prison. Nobody knows where he is. So when Onesiphorus comes to Rome, he has to go all out to find him, to figure out where he is. And then he helps him. He, he ministers to him. He provides for, because when you're in uh, death row in a Roman imprisonment, they're not providing you uh, a bedding. They're not providing you anything but mere subsistence food to keep you alive, right? They don't care about your well-being, right? You're not going down and, and taking classes at the local, you know, uh, uh, school that's coming into your prison. None of that stuff happens, right, in terms of here. And in the ancient word, prisons were places to keep people until you punish them. 
in the modern world, basically post the Victorian times, prisons became places that you put people in there as punishment. But in the ancient world, prisons were only places where you held people until they were punished, right? So there's nothing here that, that's positive all about Paul. Things are, are grim. He's in this place. But for the most part, most of the people that he thought were going to identify with him, not because of, of being just his friend, but they would identify him, with him because they identified with Jesus, right? Because remember back in chapter 1, he says, don't be ashamed of me, Timothy, or of our Lord and his testimony, Right? So by standing back from Paul, they have stood back from identifying with the Jesus of Paul, and they've abandoned him. And so Paul is there. So that's an honest assessment. Paul is not saying things are great. How are you? Fine. Right? No, no, all of those have, divert, uh, have deserted him. Something is deeply wrong in those who have abandoned him. He knows it, and he speaks it. At the same time, right, Christ stands with him. So on the one hand, he's aware that he's deserted largely by the people that he was looking to for support. And I think for Paul in particular, as we read everything about him, he's disappointed in them, not because he deserved to be treated better, but because he's worried about what that says about their own commitment to Jesus. He's worried about that, that at the time when they need to stand for Christ, they backed away from him. He's worried about them. So it's not there. And what are his needs, right? If you think about his needs, Paul is committed to Christ. He's going to be faithful, right? As we sang in our song, whether or not anybody else is faithful alongside of him. He's committed. Christ alone is sufficient. But Paul knows that we're not designed as believers to be alone, right? Paul doesn't, you know, get, raise his hand and say, I don't care. Everybody leaves me. I don't need you. I don't need you people, you worthless people. I don't need you. I'm going to follow Jesus on my own so you guys can take a hike. No, he doesn't say that at all, right? He yearns for those people to be around him. He, he, he asked Timothy twice, right? In, in Greek, if you want to urgently plead with someone, you put it in a form that sounds very odd for English. You, you, you give them a command, right? You put it in a mood that's a command. You, you say, and what it winds up being, please, please, Timothy, Try as hard as you can to get here. That's what he says. And then, then he says later, please, Timothy, please come before winter, right? From November to March in the ancient world, you couldn't travel by boat. So he wants Timothy, there's a window that's going to close, and he wants Timothy to come. Please, please, Timothy, come before winter, right? Whether Paul knows that his execution is imminent, but he wants him to come. And so Paul yearns for the presence and support of the people who love him. This made me think um, uh, how important it is to be in the presence of people who are suffering and what the ministry of presence is. I'm sure Paul was not looking for them to come preach him a sermon so much as he was just looking for them to come be with him and to say, I love you, I care for you, I'm here in your suffering with you. And he yearns for them. So Paul has a need. He's, he's vulnerable. He's, he's vulnerable about his need. I need people to come. It's not that I'm this self-sufficient guy that's going to go on. No, I will be faithful to Christ. He can supply what I need. Ultimately, my sufficiency is in him. But as a healthy Christian, I know that I'm wired to be around other believers in times of difficulty. And one of the things, if you're in trouble, if you're here this morning and you're, you're struggling mentally, you're struggling psychologically, you're, you're struggling relationally, you need other believers in Christ to sustain you. That's the way we're wired. That's the way God provides his presence and blessing to us through his people. And so Paul, he yearns to be there. But he's honest about that. He's not, you know, you guys, I don't need you at all. Fine, I'll do without. No, he doesn't get, he doesn't get bitter. He doesn't do any of those things. He yearns to be around those people. Now, a couple of things here I just want to say about, about Paul when he says this. He doesn't lapse into self-pity. Okay? He doesn't lapse into self-pity. He's not even just a woe is me mentality. Oh, everything's bad, right? And neither does he act as if everything is okay. So Paul doesn't come and say, well, a Christian should always be fine. Right? So when I come in, we know the rules, right? So Dorcas walks in, I say, Dorcas, how are you? She knows the rules. She's supposed to say, I'm fine, Greg, because I don't want to mess with her mess, right, if she isn't fine, right? So don't tell me, Dorcas, just be fine, right? And if you're a good Christian, sometimes people think, well, I always should be fine. 
I shouldn't be crying about anything. I shouldn't be worried about things deeply. No, no, no. If, if we're followers of Jesus, we're concerned about being faithful when we're in times of trouble. And we know in times of trouble, we're vulnerable and we can fail. And we're also concerned for our friends and our family when they're in times of trouble because it's difficult. And we know that the evil one wants to undermine their health and wants to draw them away from him. We know that that's the case, right? So on the one hand, right, he's no Pollyanna, right? Not mouthing platitudes while denying the darkness of the moment, right? Paul doesn't say things are great, right? God is in control, right? All things are working together with good, right? As if nothing is happening on the ground. Now, all those are true. God is good. God is great. He is in control. But those are not things that you say and deny the difficulty of the moment. And that's what sometimes if you've ministered to somebody who's in difficulty and you come in and mouth those platitudes without paying attention to the nature of their suffering, they just say, you, you don't, you're not in touch with me at all. You're not attempting to, to touch me at all. You're just trying to use those words to actually stay outside of my suffering. So he's got Roman opposition, the abandonment of brothers, and he's got psychological and physical deprivation. Right? Paul, right, if you, if you read about Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, some of us don't think about this. One of the things that he says that is so provocative, he says, we had moments in our lives as followers of Jesus that we despaired even of living. I mean, it's a dark moment. He sees the moment clearly, and he's neither denying its challenges or denying his resources, right? And so one of the things that, one of the things that as we love each other and you step into someone who's suffering, you need to let them tell you about the difficulties that they're facing. You need to let them tell you about how hard it is, about how they're struggling mentally or psychologically, about the, the pressures that it's putting on them. You need to hear that, right? And they need to be honest, Right? If you've ever ministered to someone, one of the things that you're thinking about, especially in terms of health, is you don't want to depress a person with the realities of where they are, but you don't want them to live in denial of what's happening. You want them to be honest with themselves right? and not live as if something really is to happen. So he's not a Pollyanna on the one hand, and he's not an Eeyore on the other hand. Right? He's not an Eeyore. Paul doesn't wallow in self-pity. Right? Notice his whole comments at the end aren't taken up with him telling them just about how bad things are and how bad off I am, how lousy my fellow Christians are, woe is me, things are terrible, how can I face this, I don't deserve this, you know, all those kind of conversations. That's not what you find Paul doing. Right? And, and again, on a human level, we can understand him doing that. Right? We can understand him doing that, and many of us have engaged in that kind of thing. Right? He doesn't use suffering to make other people feel bad about their lives. Right? Have you ever had somebody who just says, well, you know, they always top your suffering with their suffering? Well, I know your day is bad, but you didn't have my day. Oh, you win the suffering, you win the suffering competition, right? I should feel worse for you and you should have no compassion for me because obviously I don't have any difficulties, right? He doesn't play that game. He doesn't try to blackmail them. He doesn't try to shame them. He doesn't try to do those things, right? He doesn't draw on their rightful pity for him to try to coerce them or to guilt them or to do things like that, right? And if you've ever seen someone who just have their resources in Christ and they're the one that could be in this kind of position and out of that, they're loving people, they're concerned about other people, you know that's something supernatural. Supernatural. So Paul doesn't sugarcoat what's happening to present himself in a better light or to make the situation seem better than it is. He doesn't. If you've been abandoned by someone, that's hard. If you're yearning for a son or a daughter to turn to Christ and you've been praying your whole life and or oriented your whole life around them and now they're adult and they're walking away from Christ, that breaks your heart every day you think about them. If you've got a spouse who has abandoned you emotionally or they're suffering with something in of themselves and they're pulling into themselves and kind of leaving you on the side, you didn't envision retirement being like this. You didn't envision your marriage going in these directions. And when you're in those things, you feel lonely, you feel abandoned, you're struggling, right? All those kind of things. Paul did not sugarcoat what was going on. He was abandoned. And just to sit there and think about that, 
Paul doesn't fall into the woe is me, self-pity as if his life is unfair or he doesn't deserve what he's facing. He honestly portrays the situation he's in. He's not fine. Things are not going great. He labels the bad things. He celebrates and draws on God's resources directly and through the faithful to God around him. He is present personally, Christ is, and he is there to care, right, for, with Luke and Anessa Forrest. And Christ has provided for everything. So Paul is an honest appreciation. He's not a Pollyanna. And he's not a woe is me Eeyore, right on the either side, okay? So Paul is honest. He's vulnerable. Now, let me just pose a question to you at the end of this one, okay? When the walls come closing in, are you honest about what's going on? Are you honest about what's going on? If you're in a time of difficulty, you feel lonely, you feel abandoned, you feel hurt, are you honest? What's happening inside of you? Right? That's the first one. So Paul's honest. And if you would describe and have a conversation with a brother and sister where you could be honest about what's going on, what are you afraid of? What are you insecure about? What are the types of things that are driving you? Okay, second thing that we see in Paul, he's focused on the mission, right? This is interesting. He's focused on the mission. All you find is Paul is aware of the people in, that are on mission, right? What Paul talks about is he's aware of all of these different people, and it's amazing how many names that he goes through, right? Right at the beginning, do your best, verse 9, to come to me, for Demas, because he's loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica, right? Now, what describes here, if you read back up about Demas, look back up into verse um, 8, right? From verse 9, look back up into verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Well, the contrast here is Paul looks forward for the realization of everything that God's going to provide in the future. All of a sudden, Demas has changed his vision, and now he's living for this age, this moment. He's got a different set of values. He's turned his back on Christ and his mission. Whether this is a moment where Demas has just been faithless and he's just gotten overwhelmed, you know, a Peter moment where he's denying Christ and moving back, or whether he's talking about a full abandonment of the faith, it seems like the former rather than the latter. But all of a sudden, Demas, who had been one of his close workers, had been one of his close protégés, one of his colleagues, has now all of a sudden just turned his back apparently on the faith. He's walked away from Jesus and he lives as if he belongs to the values of the current age. But Paul is concerned about Demas. He's concerned about what's going on in his life. He's concerned about the impact on his life and, and the impact on the mission. And then he starts recounting all the different people, right? Uh, Crescens is going to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke is with me, right? Now, when we read about Luke being with him, it doesn't seem that he's trying to say that only Luke is the faithful person, but only Luke can be with him because many of the other people are doing good things, right? They're on mission, but only Luke is able to be with him in this kind of way at this moment. So he's there with Luke by his side in terms of that. But he's concerned about the spiritual health and the mission of what's going on. And so Paul is ministering right up until the end. Look down in verse 12. He says here, um, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Now, most people think here that, that Paul has already dispatched Tychicus to go to Ephesus. That's where Timothy is, so that Timothy can put down his job and let Tychicus take it over so he can go to Rome, right? So Paul is planning and strategizing. He's sending people here and there. He knows where this person is. He knows the spiritual state of that person, right? He's other focused, right? He's focused on the mission. And uh, notice here, look in verse 13. This is kind of interesting. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with you, with, at, with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, uh, one of the things that, that happens when you get under stress and, and uh, the options in life get changed, do you stop reading your Bible? Do you stop tending to your heart and your soul because it's useless? Well, Paul, one of the resources he wants for how much ever time he has, he wants the books. <laughs> he wants to read. He wants to He's still envisioning ministry until Christ takes him home. And so he wants the writing material so that he can carry on writing. So he's envisioning, I don't know how much longer God's going to give me. I know that it looks grim. 
But Timothy, bring these things with me. Bring these resources for my own spiritual health and bring these resources so that I can continue on ministry, right? So he hasn't thrown in the towel. He hasn't just, you know, gotten a fetal position and crawled up in the corner of his cell, right? He hasn't done any of those. And all of us would understand that, that this might be the case if you were aware of the situation here, right? And then look in verse 17. He said, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, right? His major concern in verse 17, notice what he's concerned about giving strength. Now, this is, this is something that, that is, is, is very much uh, an indicative of Paul's maturity and his Christ focus. One of the ways that people's immaturity shows up in their times of crisis is that they're appealing to God for things that God doesn't necessarily promise as their main appeal. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. Um, when you, when you, if you get deathly ill and you have a, a, a terminal diagnosis, there is no promise in Scripture that if you pray and ask God, He will heal you from that. Now, he, can He? Yes. Has He done that? Yes. Can He do that? Yes. So He can do that, but there's no promise from God, but that, that when a person becomes completely consumed with their health in the moment, that is an indicator, I know this is a hard thing to say, but this is an indicator of their immaturity. When they come to a time of trial, their major concern is the spiritual threat that the trial poses. And what they're going to lean into is ask God for the resources to be faithful through it. Because they do know that God will provide them the resources to be faithful to Christ through it. God never promises they'll physically survive it. And so what Paul does is he, what he's pumped about is not that he's got a promise from God that he's going to get freed from this execution. What he's pumped about is that God has so provided for him in such a way that he's been faithful. This echoes the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 10 when Jesus said, you know, you're going to be like sheep among wolves, right? Matthew 10, all that encouraging word Jesus gives, you're going to be like sheep among wolves. And you're going, that doesn't look very encouraging, Jesus, right? Uh, and they're going to haul you up in the synagogues and beat you, and your family is going to turn their backs on you. Well, Jesus, this is really dark, right? But then right in the middle of it, Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. The Spirit of God will enable you to be faithful. Okay, Jesus, I'm really glad that I'll be faithful, but, but will my family turn to Jesus and, and love me again? Well, that's not what he promises. What, what about will they stop beating me in the synagogue? He doesn't say that. But he says what, what God will provide. And so Paul speaks as a follower of Jesus and said, well, all the only thing I'm concerned about is being faithful. That is what I want to be. So my main concern in the midst of this trial is, will I be faithful? Will I love my wife or husband well as they go through this difficult moment? Will I love my kids well as they do this? Lord, I want to represent you and your values and your priorities. Lord, I don't want to be self-absorbed. I don't want to be focused on me. Lord, help me, Lord, to follow you in this moment. Lord, you need to give me strength not to be consumed by worry. You need to give me strength not to keep asking you for something as if I know your will better than you do, right? Like James chapter 4, you ask me with evil motives. You just want to use me as if I'm an ATM in the sky, no, you come to me and you, you humble yourself before me and call out to me and I will hear you. And so this is what Paul does. He's concerned about his mission effectiveness. What he's in, relieved about is that he didn't turn his back on Jesus. I'm so relieved because he supplied what I need, right? So the question I want to put here, right, when the walls come closing in, what is your focus? What is your focus, Right? When your kids are driving you crazy, when your husband is being an idiot, which that never happens with husbands, only occasionally, right? When your husband is being an idiot, when your wife is neglecting the things that you need, right? When you've got a stressful situation at work, what is your focus? To get your boss to shut up, to get him fired, her fired, right? To get more money, Right, to have a better situation for yourself, to, for your wife to finally wake up, for your neighbors to quit being idiots. I, didn't you, you see that little story over the, the last couple of days? I think it was in England, had these two neighbors that during the COVID thing, they had formerly been good friends and then they fell out and they had this tree that, that sat right on their property line 
and the trunk of the tree was on one person's property line, but the, the round part of the tree was on the other person's property. It was like eight foot up and over. And so they fought and fought and fought, and finally they came to a settlement, and the people that didn't have the tree just butched the tree so it now is half of a tree right on the side, right? And now I guess their lives are all better because they don't have to put up with the limbs of the tree on their side, right? And so it's been circulating everywhere, seeing this tree that is this, what had been this nice round circle is now this, you know, uh, lollipop that's all been eaten off of one side, right? So the kind of thing here is, what is your focus in the moment? Is it really to be faithful? Are you more concerned as a wife today, I want to be faithful follower of Jesus than I want my husband to do X? Is my biggest, my biggest concern about my job is that they know I love Jesus and I've represented him well? Is that the biggest important thing with me and my kids? Right, that's the kind of thing here. Okay, thirdly, Paul is concerned about and promoting the spiritual health of those in his sphere of influence. He's concerned about and promoting the spiritual health. Okay? Um, he knows about the people, and we mentioned this here. He knows about Demas, right, in verse 10. Right? He knows about Demas. Demas has turned his back. He's concerned about Demas. Luke is with him, right? He knows Luke, and Luke is there ministering to him. And he's aware, obviously, of everything that's going on in Timothy's life, right? He's aware. All, the whole book has been counseling Timothy, recalling their deep friendship, right? Doing all those kinds of things. So he's concerned about the spiritual health of other people. The whole book represents Paul's counsel to Timothy to help him keep keeping on in the face of great adversity, right? So what's Paul laboring in the last parts of his life? Not to deal with all of his enemies, not to point out all the ways in which he's been treated badly, right? Not to celebrate his victories and how what a great person he was, right? But what he wants to do is he just wants to make sure, as Pastor Steve was talking about, that the baton was passed well and that, that Timothy is going well, right? And he's navigating these very difficult moments. That's what he's really concerned about. In this moment, it's not really about him. It's about Christ and the mission. And so God's drawing his time to a close. Timothy's going to carry on. And so he's accepted that, and he's putting his energies in Timothy, right, all the way through. So the question here about this one is when the walls come closing in, are you concerned about the people around you, right? Are you concerned about the people around you, right? It is one of the characteristic things when things go bad, we usually get self-absorbed. How bad my life is, how difficult things are for me. Right? And we expect everybody else to jump in and make it easier for me because things are obviously very bad. And so I don't have time for your difficulties right now. I don't have time that things aren't going well in your life. I don't even have energy to listen to you about your stuff anymore. It's just all about me right now. And I, if you would recognize that, we would all be in good shape. Right? So that's the kind of thing here. Then fourthly, right? Paul extends grace as one who knows grace. Paul extends grace as one who knows grace. Look down in... Uh, verse 17, or verse 16, I'm sorry. At my first events, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May they get what they deserve. That's what he says, right? Now he says, may it not be held against them. Now, I want to suggest to you, if you've ever been abandoned by somebody in, in a moment where you were really counting on their support, that's not the first thing you think about. You don't want to immediately go, oh, that's okay. No, you're hurt. You may be angry, right? And you may lash out, and the people around you are going to get it, right? Because at a moment where you needed someone that you trusted, that you put your life into, that you, you had maybe spent life on them, right? You'd spent life on them, hours, money, time, energy, prayers. And all of a sudden, when, when the road gets hard, boom, they're gone. They're not there, they're not supporting you, they're not behind you. Well, that, that hurts. And, and then people go through grief and anger, and they realize maybe I didn't have the depth of relationship I thought I had with these people. How could they take all my life energies and all my time that I've poured on them, and it should be so light to them that they just kick me to the curb just like that? All right, so Paul is there. This is something that God has to do for a person to get deep inside of grace so that they can ask for God to extend grace to people who have sinned so desperately against them, right? 
and you remember Paul's testimony, take your Bibles and go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 with me for a moment. All right, go back at 1 Timothy chapter 1. All right, Paul never got over God's grace in his life, God's loving favor to him, right? Paul was undeserving, and he never got over the fact that God had saved him when he deserved God's judgment. So he all often labeled himself as the chief of sinners. He does this at least twice in his writings. And Paul wasn't trying to, to, to build some great testimony or to coin some phrase. He really, really felt that he was the worst of the worst. And he had a track record to prove it. He had killed the followers of Jesus. Right? When Paul came to Christ, it's no wonder that they had to, God had to also appeal to Zacharias right, directly and say, Zacharias, you've got to go after this guy. And Zacharias himself said, I want to go after this guy. You've got to be kidding me. Right? No, no, no. I'm doing something in his life, and I want you to be the guy that stands up for him and says that something really good happened to him. I want you to do that. Because right? who would want to welcome Paul into their house church? He's arrested half of the people. Right? He's after people. He's, he's there when Stephen is stoned. He's got blood on his hands, literally. Right? So here he is in his testimony in verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, and he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, he was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Do you, you see yourself as someone who's the worst of sinners? A mature follower of Christ who's anchored in him will be a person who will respond with grace to other people's failures because they know grace. You know, isn't it, isn't it a temptation when you're hurting to lash out at other people, to crank up your expectations for people, and then when they let you down to really hammer it? And then to hammer it by, in the moment when I really needed you, that's when you checked out. Right? Because it gets more egregious then. It's just uglier then. Right? And here's Paul with the heart of Jesus, right? It echoes the prayer of Jesus from the cross. Lord, please, would you forgive them? Because they don't understand what they're doing. And here's Paul with the heart of Christ saying, Lord, please, don't put that on their account. Lord, be gracious to them as you were gracious to me, right? And one of the things that you find of a person who has a deep attachment to Christ when they're under stress, they don't take it out on other people. And they're also willing to extend grace to people because when you go through stress, you want to you know something? There's not a manual for how to treat you when you're in a stressful situation. The manual may be in your head, Right? But when your life falls apart, the people around you are struggling to try to love you in that moment. And they're trying to be kind, they're trying to be understanding, they're trying to be that, and you're maybe going through this periods of grief, and you're, you're angry, you're lashing out, you're frustrated, you're dealing with these kinds of things. The people around you, there's no manual for what to say at every moment. And sometimes when we're in hard situations, as soon as a person steps outside the bounds of what we should, should say, we say, well, that was a stupid thing to say. All that kind of stuff like that. Well, Paul, he's not raging. He's not lashing out at people. He's there saying, God, please forgive them. This is a hard situation. This is difficult. Lord, please forgive them. So, right, when things are hard, are you gracious? Men, when things went hard at your work, did you take it out on your wife or kids, right, or your dog, right, when you got home? Right? If you, are you one of those people that if you're having a crappy day, everybody's going to have a crappy day? I, I think one of the stupidest things, I understand the, the lightness of it and, and in a good way, but it should be wrong in any home to say, if, if mom ain't happy, nobody's happy. It shouldn't be true either. If dad ain't happy, nobody's happy. It should be, if mom ain't happy, mom's leaning in on Jesus 
to try to love out of her own difficulty, and I don't understand how mom behaves the way she does given the pressure she's under. Right? That's a very different thing. And so Paul here, he's not, he's not scorching the earth. He's not drawn on everybody with expectations. It's a very different thing. Right? And then finally, the last one here, Paul is strengthened by the presence and promises of Christ. He's strengthened by the presence and promises of Christ. Right? Look here at this, this phrase here. At my first events, verse 16, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them, but the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. And we don't know here exactly what Paul means here. We don't think that he means a literal lion as if he was going to be fed to the lions because he's going to die. He's going to be beheaded outside the walls of Rome. It may be a way of speaking about Nero as the lion, uh, as someone who was just a ravenous beast in terms of that. It could be a reference to the evil one, to Satan himself. But Paul was delivered from every evil attack. And notice his deliverance is not a physical deliverance. His deliverance is a spiritual deliverance. He was delivered from anger and bitterness. He was delivered from fear. He was delivered from self-centeredness and selfishness. He was delivered from, right, running away from Christ and turning his back on Christ. And he was delivered to the presence of Christ. And he's confident as God has enabled him through life, he's promised that he's going to take him because Paul remembers the resurrection. Right? I trust the promises of Jesus. So where do you look for strength? Right? The question here about this one, where do you look for strength when the walls are closing in? All right, so Paul throughout the letter has patiently taught, rebuked, corrected, encouraged by word and life, just as he wants Timothy and those that he trains to do. Now he shows us how to go out, how to finish. He doesn't retire. I say this to all of us old people, right? There is no retiring from the cause of Jesus. He doesn't retire. He doesn't turn over to the next generation and say he's done his time. He's trained the next generation, but he's going to serve God until he dies. He is fulfilling his calling as long as God gives him life and breath. The circumstances make it very difficult, especially the abandonment by believers close to him, but that doesn't mean he should stop. He just needs to adapt to the circumstances and keep moving forward until God takes him home. Jesus is present with him to sustain his spiritual life and his calling, as well to assure him of the future fulfillment. So, I don't know if you're in a difficult moment or you're in a difficult moment with somebody else. Right? But here's a man who faces a dark, dark moment. Maybe one like we'll never have to face, Lord willing. Right? Many people around the world in the Christian faith are facing these kinds of days. Right? People in North Korea, people in China, Right? People in different places, right, are facing these kinds of days. Are we those kinds of people? Do we have those kind of resources? And as James would teach us, you can't get ready for the hard times when they come. You're getting ready for the inevitable hard times of this side of life, right? Remember Paul's call to Timothy, come suffer hardship with me. You get ready with them every day as you walk with Jesus. And when the reversals come, when the difficulties come, the way you'll be unstoppable is because you have a real connection to the Lord who has delivered you, is delivering you, and will deliver you, and that will sustain you through widowhood, through sickness, through abandonment, through financial reversal, through fear, through past trauma, through struggles with addiction. That's what will sustain you. In unity with God's people who will love you, when you're too weak to stand on your own. So that's what God calls us to in the Unstable. Grayson, would you come and Jacqueline sing? Then I'll come back with a few questions for us to mull a little bit later.